Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Hathorn. I am chairman of the board of directors for CNU Utah. CNU Utah is a local chapter of the Congress for the New Urbanism. Internationally, CNU is recognized as the leading professional organization for promoting walkable mixed-use neighborhood development, sustainable communities, and healthier living conditions. Regionally, CNU Utah has defined its mission as one to educate, advocate, initiate, and implement the principles of CNU's charter as they pertain to the particular needs of our beautiful state. More specifically, CNU Utah strives to educate its members and the public about the mission and purposes of CNU, advocate for the purposes of CNU, and further the application of CNU principles in communities among members, allied professionals, civic leaders, and decision makers, initiate projects and programs that further the purpose and principles of CNU, support membership in implementing best practices and projects while also working to recognize professionals who exemplify and advance the purposes and principles of CNU. As part of CNU Utah, as part of these efforts, CNU Utah has successfully held a number of webinars on topics that we have felt provide benefit to issues relevant to Utah right now. Those efforts continue with today's webinar and through the generosity of our speaker, Galina Takieva from DPZ, and our sponsor, Woodbury Corporation. Galena is an expert on sustainable planning, urban redevelopment, sprawl repair, and form-based codes. As a partner and director of town planning at Guani Plater Zyberk and Company, architects and town planners, she directs and manages the design and implementation of projects in the U.S. and around the world. Galena is also the author of the Sprawl Repair Manual, an award-winning publication and the first of its kind to focus on the retrofit of auto-centric suburban places into complete walkable communities. Hailing from Bulgaria, where she received her degree in architecture, Galena later completed her master's in urban design at the University of Miami, Florida. She is certified AICP, LEED AP, and as a CNU Fellow. Organized in 1935, Woodbury Corporation is one of the oldest and most respected real estate brokerage development and management companies in Utah. Woodbury Corporation is a full-service real estate brokerage development, management, and consulting firm that currently owns, controls, and or manages approximately $1 billion worth of productive shopping centers, offices, and medical and industrial buildings. Woodbury Corporation and Galena Tapiega worked together in the planning and design of the $500 million redevelopment project for the University Mall in Orem, Utah. The project, called University Place, will include high-rise office buildings, a multifamily development, a hotel, a community park, and an extensive renovation plan for the existing shopping center. Portions of that project are currently under construction. We would like to thank both Galena as our presenter and Woodbury Corporation as our sponsor for helping us to provide this wonderful learning opportunity. Thank you both for assisting CNU Utah in our efforts to educate. Before I turn the time over to Galena, I'd like to ask and remind all of our participants today, please keep your microphones on mute so as to minimize the amount of audio disruption during the presentation portion of the webinar. Your assistance with this will be greatly appreciated. If you have questions for Galena, they can be submitted for our Q&A portion of the webinar via the chat tool in the lower right-hand corner of your screen or through Twitter at hashtag CNUUtah. With that, I would, like, I would now like to turn the time over to Galena. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess now we are going to put the presentation on. Um, I'm very happy to be presenting to um, CNU uh, Utah. Uh, DPZ has worked uh, in many places in Utah, like Salt Lake City, Moab, uh, St. George, or in Saratoga Springs. And uh, we have been learning a lot about uh, your planning traditions. Uh, so as I said, you know, DPZ, um, have done work uh, in uh, Utah, and we are uh, very happy to um, have done projects, and some of them are already under uh, under construction. 
um, we um, I just wanted to start with a, with a quote by Brigham Young, kind of to put everything in the right mood and in the right perspective. From you know, he wrote something about the building cities and how to make communities uh, beautiful and uh, lovable. Uh, and the, uh, the quote uh, starts like that, uh, progress and improve upon and make beautiful everything around you. Build cities, adorn your habitations, make gardens, orchards, and vineyards, and render the earth so pleasant that when you look upon your labors, you may do so with pleasure, and that angels may delight to come and visit your beautiful location. Uh, so uh, we have been fascinated by Mormon planning and the place-making traditions, which uh, you have uh, implemented uh, many years ago in the making of uh, many, many uh, towns and settlements. This is a beautiful rendering of Salt Lake City uh, from 1867, and you can see the variety of human environments from a very uh, denser, um, more urban condition in the higher portion of the drawing, all the way to natural conditions and you know little bits and pieces of uh, even agriculture. Uh, and the uh, you can probably even recognize the wide uh, boulevards and with the uh, horse carriages. Um, sometimes the simple uh, grid, uh, or most of the time, actually based on the principles of uh, the flat of Zion. Uh, overlaid uh, on the ground, and uh, there is a perfect harmony between the man-made uh, and the uh, and the natural. This was the uh, a kind of the main uh, goal and uh, the main result of the traditions, of the Mormon planning tradition. Probably uh, the Mormons have become, or they were actually uh, some of the most successful city builders, town builders in the history of American planning. There were more than uh, 500, here I'm reading, 765 new communities were done, and more than 500 are still uh, in existence uh, today. This is uh, quite a feat of accomplishment uh, for, uh, for 100 years. Uh, and here we can see, and these are uh, studies from our prior projects, um, learning from the block structure, from the rich well, uh, and the, the richness and the wealth uh, different uh, types of blocks, different types of streets, public spaces, you can see a more orthogonal or square block system and then going into a victory park, for example, where there is more uh, garden type of, of a street structure. Uh, we took uh, some of the examples in the mega block, the 660 by 660 feet uh, block, and uh, uh, started experimenting uh, in the name of a kind of future implementation of some of these uh, uh, planning traditions, and uh, we found out that it's very, uh, very, it's a very flexible block, very flexible structure, and you can accommodate the full range of human experiences from the urban core to the urban center, all the way to suburban and rural in different uh, uh, different design uh, techniques. Uh, but uh, what is happening today? Today we have um, a very clear dichotomy in the models of development and growth in uh, Utah. Uh, on the right side of the screen, uh, you see uh, this is Salt Lake City uh, with uh, uh, its main spine with the light rail, a very well-defined urban realm with the mountains uh, in the background, in the uh, a determinated with a beautiful environment, and on the uh, on the left is uh, a typical condition, which is State Street, uh, which actually is condition which can be anywhere around the country. These are very similar uh, type of uh, type of images, which can be fairly interchangeable around the country. So you can see the big contrast between the two. Um, your natural, the beauty of your state is uh, absolutely um, questionable, and uh, we have many times uh, encountered uh, very close, actually, to your settlements, to some of the towns, which is the beauty of, uh, of this type of uh, planning, where in vicinity of uh, high urbanity you can have a natural beauty. But what about the built environment of the last 50 or 60 years? Uh, unfortunately, you have uh, fell victim to the same uh, planning mistakes which we have 
encountered around the country and around the world. Fraud has become very prevalent. Commercial development looks like something like this, and this unfortunately can be anywhere around the country, with the exception of some Western little elements here and there, uh, in the, uh, like in the detailing in the shopping center. And the uh, residential development, you can see here, it's a single use uh, a type of development, very wide streets. Everything is the kind of centered around the uh, around the car. And I want to here to do to, to just show another another quote, very literal, and probably I cannot just say it more in a funnier or more uh, a kind of uh, interesting way. Uh, he uh, he's saying the following about your system of planning or the Mormon tradition of planning. You have a Ferrari in the garage, and this is about the city of. Uh, Zion and the, the plating of them, and you have never taken it for a drive. You have never shown what it could really do. You're taking your Ferrari and you're using it as a dump truck. You have turned this Ferrari of a block. You have turned this Ferrari of a right of way, and you have actually turned it into a utilitarian mentality rather than a poetic mentality. The utilitarian mentality has taken it over. You have never been shown what the city of Zion can do. And I'm pretty convinced that however beautifully this flat of Zion works, and remember it did work, it has lost its way. Many of the things that make your suburban sprawl so easy were not the intention of Brigham Young. I'm not putting him in hot water, I'm putting you in hot water. So I'm not uh, as, um, as brave to say these things, but when I quote from Andres, it's, uh, it seems easier. Uh, yes, we have to sprawl around the country, and the thing is that the sprawl in Utah is very similar to the sprawl in Atlanta. It's very similar to our sprawl here in Miami and in Florida. Uh, it is very similar to the one in uh, New York, Long Island. Here, for example, we're showing Orem, Utah, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. But the paradigm, the, the stereotypes are very, very, uh, very, very similar. The reality, unfortunately, is very much uh, similar as well. There is a lot of... Uh, the result, the real metrics uh, which we achieve through implementing sprawl are, you know, tremendous congestion, pollution, uh, loss of open space, loss of resources. Uh, so we don't necessarily need to show a lot of statistics. We just can look around us and see how uh, we have fared uh, by building sprawl. Uh, about uh, um, 56 years ago, there was a very clear transition. Uh, and the transition was from the walkable, uh, compact, mixed-use communities, which we call complete communities, to a car-oriented scale. There was a book by Constantinos Bucciaris who wrote about this transition. He was very aware that by, by introducing the car to the city and also allowing it to uh, basically rule, to be the king of our settlements, we have to change the parameters and the physicality of our cities to accommodate the car. Today we're talking about a different transition, the opposite, in the opposite direction from the car-oriented scale to the walkable community. And the sprawl repair manual was born of such a need, uh, which we feel uh, throughout the many states in the country. Uh, Dr. Yadis drew actually this uh, simple diagram showing the conflict between auto scale and the human scale. Uh, it is not very pretty, but it shows uh, the um, contradiction in the conflict. You cannot have uh, cities which accommodate 100% the car with its speed and uh, the possibility of reaching to places in a, a shorter period of time uh, and uh, to have the same uh, walkable structures as our traditional cities. And this is what the big challenge will be. Uh, to look at the model on the left, which is sprawl, which can be anywhere in USA, and to achieve a beautiful city like Savannah, for example, which uh, is very similar in the grid of structure, um, block structure to the Mormon planning tradition, for that matter. Uh, so the two models, again, I want to, if there is something for you to take away from this uh, whole presentation and exercise, is that the goal, the big goal of sprawl repair is to take the elements which are in sprawl, Usually, our, our, the sprawl development consists of a very defined in-place. They're either residential or commercial, you know, retail shops or offices separate. All these things are separate. To take these elements and make real 
complete neighborhoods and communities. The, the drawing here shows um, complete community of, uh, uh, which consists of the district neighborhoods and corridors. They're well connected. The centers are very well defined. While in sprawl, uh, uh, there is no uh, defined urban structure. There are no uh, centers, no edges. The connectivity is much uh, less. It's uh, much more uh, uh, dendritic uh, system. Um, so there is even even in, in our in the circles uh, among the new urbanists, uh, we uh, uh, very often argue uh, between ourselves: Do we need to do something with sprawl? You know, there are questions at the last uh, Congress for the New Urbanism in Dallas. There were even uh, debates: Do we need to repair sprawl? Is it a worthwhile effort? And uh, because we know that sprawl doesn't work uh, for the economy anymore, it is too expensive to build, it's uh, 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 based on an ever-expanding infrastructure. The cost to the U.S. economy, you know, we saw the latest numbers all over the media a few weeks ago, it's over one trillion annually. Uh, overstretched commuters cannot afford the transportation costs. Delivers, sprawl delivers much lower municipal revenues per acre, as some of the latest studies uh, by economists are showing. I believe you've had another another webinar with Joe Minikosi, who is doing this uh, economic studies. The demographics and the, uh, it's very different, and there is a strong market shift towards more urban and workable environments. The young, you know, the so-called millennials, the older generation, the baby boomers, even the Eisenhower, they're not served well by uh, communities where only driving is the option, where you have to go to your needs everywhere by car. The immigrants, you know, today they're changing our suburbs. We, in some cases, they become ethnoburbs. Uh, and these immigrants have grown up in places where they're more welcome. So they have other needs. Our minorities, our working class, the poor, they're not served well by uh, places which are entirely dependent on the car. And in general, where there is a new awareness about the environment, about health, about aging. So it just, it does Scroll doesn't work uh, anymore. But can we abandon scroll? No, we cannot. Some uh, suggest that we just can leave it alone and uh, go and do work only in our inner city. But we cannot do that because there is too much investment of money, resources, infrastructure, human energy, and dreams uh, in our uh, sprawling communities. Uh, there will be a growth of 100 million people in the next 50 years, which can will, and they will not be able to be uh, to be accommodated only in the existing cities in our downtowns and the first generation of suburbs. We will have to go and repair, infill, redevelop our second and third tier suburbs, uh, and they have to be uh, retrofitted in a selective, nodal way. Um, and probably one of the most important uh, arguments that we cannot abandon from is that there is a 50-year lifespan of infrastructure and utilities and a 25-year lifespan on the heating. And this uh, lifespan will um, raise taxes so high that we will need to retrofit uh, certain places. Otherwise, uh, these places have to basically evolve. They will not be able to exist anymore. So we have to be very careful how we will choose our infrastructure investment and return on investment. And from a human point of view, uh, improving, upgrading, rebalancing the lives of people, and another statistic here, 44 million Americans live in the 51 major metro areas, while 122 million live in their suburbs. So we cannot say no to these millions and millions of people, and probably everybody has in their family, you know, or their friends, people who live in the suburbs for one or another reason, and they will not be moving anytime soon to the most urban places. So as planners, as, as thinkers of, of the future, we need to look at uh, our sprawling communities and do, and do better. And here, these are some undeniable statistics about uh, people, you know, the percentages of people wanting public transportation, who wants detached houses, not detached houses, uh, you know, people favoring mixed-use neighborhoods, 60%. I mean, these statistics are very uh, uh, recently uh, very fast, so they're probably already old. 
Uh, but today, unfortunately, we still have an oversupply of drive-only suburbs, and we don't need too many statistics because uh, we just have to look around. Some good news, again, with some undeniable statistics, is there are already 1,200 retrofits in the United States from 223 malls, 119 office parks, to the smaller, to the smaller uh, sprawl repair types, such as gas stations and car dealerships, uh, for example. Um, and as I said before, uh, to start looking at our uh, sprawling regions, uh, we have to uh, understand neighborhood structure, how it works, how the pedestrian shed works, the, its physicality, that it's based on the physical ability of humans to uh, walk about five minute uh, walking distance, and if this is the ideal, um, uh, the ideal shape and size of, uh, of a neighborhood. And you have implemented this uh, through the last uh, 100 years, uh, till the 50s actually, the prior uh, 100 years before, before the uh, 50s of the 20, uh, 20th century in the Mormon uh, planning tradition. Uh, here, this is an example of the two models in Salt Lake City. On the left is the five minute walking uh, radius with the traditional block structure, very simple grid with, uh, you, you can see the houses are close to the street with a little uh, store mixed use on the corner. And on the left are is the much uh, uh, larger mega blocks of uh, suburbia or sprawl uh, with a lot of cul-de-sacs uh, and uh, much wider, uh, more exuberant uh, infrastructure, uh, which uh, along the way, which will be uh, more difficult to maintain because per capita it will be uh, not possible to uh, uh, to pay the taxes and to uh, take care of all the uh, expense in the future. Um, something else which we usually do uh, in every place we go, we cut special sections or the so-called transect through a place. And we have done this in Salt Lake City. Uh, basically, it is a section through from the most urban area of a place uh, to the most rural, all the way to the nature, to nature. And you can see that you, uh, uh, we are showing here in Salt Lake City a special district uh, from the um, uh, public civic buildings, from the civic buildings to the urban core with a mixed use, taller buildings, uh, urban center zone where we have a mix of residential and commercial, general urban zone uh, with houses, townhouses, uh, suburban, suburban zone with mostly houses to rural and uh, natural zones. The transect is uh, something uh, which uh, is a very valuable tool which uh, is uh, in the method of an important uh, tool in the methodology of sprawl repair. Uh, basically what happens in, uh, uh, in nature, uh, there are different, uh, different very rich environments uh, within close proximity, but in these rich environments, there are different uh, flora and fauna, and it's very similar in the human environment. While in sprawl, uh, the richness of these uh, immersive environments is lost. As you can see, the transect uh, uh, on the top shows the different enclaves, uh, whether it's a business park, shopping center, multifamily subdivision. This is only one single use and building type re re repeated uh, uh, many times. Uh, or in a similar manner. Um, so, and if you compare it to the more complex and more um, varied uh, environment to the, uh, at the uh, transect below, you will see that the two do not uh, correlate uh, directly. So the goal of the, uh, the goal of the, uh, uh, the sprawl repair is to uh, see the elements which are uh, missing other elements, other uses, and to make, again, a complete community. The sprawl repair method actually works uh, on all uh, different scales, from the very large one, from the region, through the community, the street, the uh, block, and all the way down to the building. But I said that the community uh, neighborhood scale is very crucial because region consi regions consist of uh, towns and cities which consists, on the other hand, by, uh, uh, by neighborhoods. And then the other elements, the street block and the buildings are also elements of the community. So the community, the neighborhood is a very, the neighborhood unit is a very central, uh, a very central element uh, in the planning scale within sprawl repair. 
And there are different types of tools. There are design tools, regula regulatory tools, and implementation tools. And I will touch upon some of these uh, this uh, afternoon. Um, to understand uh, uh, sprawl repair, we need to make a good distinction between suburbs and sprawl. Not all suburbs are sprawl, and not all uh, uh, sprawl is, is, is good suburb. Um, the, the initial suburbs, which were pre-war, pre-Second World War, were actually created along transportation corridors, the transportation corridors which uh, accommodated uh, public transportation, usually uh, railroad, uh, uh, railroads. Uh, Forest Hills here is, is, is given as an example of this, uh, an example of this type of development, and these uh, places were still compact around, centered around uh, the railroad uh, stations, uh, and they're called the, kind of the first generation of suburbs. With the second generation of suburbs, the post-war uh, suburbs, this is when the neighborhood structure actually was blown away, was totally destroyed, uh, because the car became uh, gave us the ability to uh, go to places and to be connected uh, in a faster way, uh, at least initially. Um, uh, this is when uh, uh, new development started to happen also along transportation corridors, but these corridors were only uh, for cars, only for uh, automobiles. Um, the third generation of suburbs, or the so-called uh, exurbs, they came in the uh, in the late in the late 80s and beyond, uh, some of the edge city syndromes uh, then uh, appeared when big concentrations of commercial uh, employment centers uh, started uh, popping up uh, very far away from our uh, central cities. Tyson's Corner in Virginia is one example. It is a good example because today it's one of the largest uh, sprawl retrofitting. Um, uh, places uh, in the country of all uh, its uh, 1,700 acres, uh, planners and developers are really trying hard to um, uh, complete, to rebalance uh, Tyson's Corner. So the sprawl repair targets actually will be in places where there is the greatest potential for connectivity, uh, for transportation connectivity, multi-modal type of transportation including uh, public transportation, including bicycles, and all other kinds, walking, of course, um, uh, uh, in closer proximities. So re these red dots show uh, the pro repair targets with this uh, greater potential. There are two ways to do that. Uh, you start doing uh, these um, redevelopment projects, and then you connect them uh, with uh, uh, public transportation. Uh, and they are the so-called transit-ready developments. The other way around is or, uh, when you already have the public transportation and then you create uh, transit-oriented developments around them. Phoenix is uh, a kind of, of the latter, latter type. They have the light trail and now they are intensifying uh, some of the nodes uh, along the light trail in the, uh, in the city. Um, repair at the regional scale. Um, uh, the regional, um, uh, region, uh, in the regional thinking, it is uh, uh, advisable to look at um, the green system, the transportation system, the, the building, the building environment as uh, as a system, as I mentioned, and you know, how they interact and how they connect with each other. Uh, if you fly over our country, in most of our regions, we see that there is a lot of regional development kind of in a hodgepodge, piecemeal way, uh, not well connected, not making uh, really complete communities, but developing uh, where the next available piece of land is. So it is important to think about this, uh, uh, this system in a, in a more holistic uh, way. So here, you know, in the SPRO Repair Manual, we delineated a few steps of how you start. Starting with the uh, green boundary or the natural boundary, preservation and reservation areas, delineating those is probably most advisable. You can uh, daylight uh, uh, streams, you can uh, see which are the environmentally sensitive areas and actually designate them uh, early on. And this is an idealized step-by-step uh, -step, uh, regional planning picture. Then prioritizing the commercial and employ employment nodes uh, in a map like this, uh, you can see that there is a, a wide range of commercial development, usually 
uh, fairly uh, far away from each other. In this uh, particular case, uh, the grid is uh, uh, one mile by one square mile. A convenience stores, uh, convenience center, neighborhood center, community center, all these are the elements of uh, mixed use uh, future communities and they can start with uh, very large uh, uh, power centers and employment centers around which uh, future development can uh, happen all the way to corner stores in neighborhoods. This one is of course very important to prioritize the potential transit and infrastructure network. Again, we are showing here an ultimate solution where there is already a heavy rail uh, uh, line. Perhaps light rail line is a plan for, you can see here in, in, in east-west direction, and then um, uh, uh, in uh, north-south direction of the BRTs uh, and other uh, connectivity within the neighborhoods, the trams, circulators, bus routes. And the dots actually show the places of intensification uh, so the final picture will be an assemblage uh, of the regional sector map where you have your greenways, you have your uh, centers uh, connected, well connected with the transit of uh, several different scales. There will be uh, also some areas which will be uh, probably left to devolution. They're so far away from anything, even from the uh, a possibility of a possibility of uh, transit reaching them, and they uh, are depending, of course, on the local communities. Um, uh, it, they, some of them, uh, especially the ones which are recently built in the so-called zombie subdivision, some of them not even fin finalized or finished or even um, inhabited, they may be left for devolution. But this is a kind of the idea, an idealized picture of this original original uh, mapping. The repair at the community scale. I will show you here a few examples of um, uh, shopping center retrofit, mall retrofits, uh, a few uh, a few examples from our work uh, in Utah and other places. Um, and um, at the end, I will uh, finish with uh, the uh, sprawl repair at the um, uh, street and uh, building uh, building scale. Um, a shopping center. Um, transformation of a shopping center into a town center, uh, usually uh, a big boxes and uh, large uh, um, commercial commercial facilities are a necessity in neighborhoods. We um, used to not have them in our traditional towns, but uh, through the uh, 20th century and later, of course, uh, we feel like we uh, cannot live without them, but uh, nevertheless, many of them uh, come and go. Uh, some of them leave behind large uh, empty shells because they were killed by competition down the street or uh, because their uh, their own business was not doing that well. So you can see here in the drawing to the left, and I probably can show with the, with, uh, you can, you know, the, the dispersed uh, building footprint, a lot of parking always happening at the front. We have built our communities to accommodate the car in the easiest, well, the easiest way, so that this is why we have these examples. And then on the right is a quite aggressive uh, urbanization, intensification, a kind of reuse of lost real estate uh, and how you can make a real place, a real maybe town center for the surrounding uh, residential communities. Um, okay, so here is, so this is an example from uh, Utah. Um, Main Street uh, and big bo boxes in Bountiful. You can see here this, this street going north-south uh, with still uh, a kind of a, uh, a nicer, uh, smaller uh, block structure with uh, many of the streets perpendicular to the Main Street. And then the, the different model, the very different model, this is a kind of a nice uh, juxtaposition, a nice contract, uh, contrast. Uh, the development which is visible for the big highway uh, on the left, with the big boxes, with the parking, uh, with the parking uh, lot, which seems like one of the largest I have ever seen, and then the buildings uh, in out parcels um, uh, at the front. Uh, another one in Sandy, Utah. This one was interesting. It had, I think, the Walmart and like the famous big boxes, and then some uh, um, an attempt to make uh, the buildings at the front. Uh, a kind of uh, with a street frontage, uh, and there were uh, there was also confusion 
that it's like a front back uh, uh, confusion. We were not sure whether uh, some of these some of these actually are looking towards the parking lot in the back, but they were attempting to show uh, storefronts at the uh, at the street level. So what do we do with these uh, parking lots which are dominating the public uh, realm? We uh, take them and we uh, redevelop them into a walkable uh, fabric. Uh, some of the big boxes, they can remain retail if they are viable, uh, they're, uh, viable uh, uh, commercial entities. If not, they can be actually uh, transformed into other uses around the country. There are many examples uh, for uh, uh, civic uses which come into these big boxes. Um, cultural uses, uh, it can be office space uh, for some of the uh, newly formed uh, uh, tech companies uh, like uh, business incubators, uh, even daycares, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in between, this is a, a lot of uh, new development, as you can see, this is a kind of a final uh, condition uh, where it, it is shown in the maximum developed uh, way with a large square in the middle uh, resolving the uh, difficult intersection and there is a retail loop which uh, connects the three entrances to the big boxes and everything is lined with habitable uh, commercial space on the ground floor and then residential above. So this is one of the very ambitious, uh, ambitious plans which actually can become a real true town center for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the uh, uh, more suburban and sprawled residential communities. Of course, there will still be a lot of driving from these places to the special intensified urbanized uh, nodes, but um, but this is shown as a kind of a final condition. If uh, there is the need for such redevelopment, these are the places which uh, should receive. Um, uh, uh, infrastructure support, infrastructure resources, and uh, certain uh, uh, certain incentives. Uh, this is showing a gradual urbanization of a highway uh, facing strip shopping center. You can see the big boxes um, on the right um, of the big boxes on the right uh, with the highway and how a gradual urbanization is happening along the along the highway, uh, a, a parallel main street is created. You can see that some of the uh, out parcels with the McDonald's and drive through uh, um, buildings are actually embedded in the urban fabric. Uh, this is probably a little bit explaining it clear, the drawing to the left, the upper corner with the boxes facing the big parking lot uh, and the highway and then the gradual urbanization uh, starting to the right, the parallel street with the, with the buildings and with the main street, and then uh, one of the boxes disappears, uh, you know, true urbanism comes in place, mixed use, and then only one small box remains. Uh, this is an idealized condition, but it, is, it happened so many times around the country that there are certain places, and this is actually based on a very real project in Texas. Uh, strip mall retrofit. Uh, strip malls are kind of a smaller, in some cases smaller, in some cases uh, larger uh, combinations of big boxes and smaller stores. Uh, there are ways, this one is a, a more um, a small scale intervention. Uh, you can see to the left the big parking lot with the commercial development and here very thin buildings which we call uh, liner buildings. Uh, are beginning to create urban fabric, a main street uh, coming from uh, one of the main approaches. Uh, the liner buildings are shown in, in black. Uh, and here you can see this is the ground level of these buildings. Uh, we preserve most of the parking in its uh, original surface condition, uh, with even along the street level, uh, the parking is still there. That's why the buildings are fairly thin. They're about 22 feet uh, deep, so it's uh, one parking uh, spot underneath. And only the corners, uh, at the corners, uh, we have a habitable, um, a habitable uh, space. Uh, here you can see these uh, in the corner conditions on the small scale, on the small uh, square. And this is how it can look in the future. You can uh, uh, visit in case of the um, uh, strip shopping center is still viable, or even if it changes uh, its use to something else, 
it is nice to introduce a residential element which will rebalance uh, the, um, uh, the and complete uh, this uh, this uh, area. And it can be uh, three or four um, three or four stories. Um, in this case, actually, it's only three uh, because on the ground floor we preserve the parking and we built a couple of, of stories, uh, a couple or uh, three stories of residential. Um, and till now, I was showing you uh, uh, pictures, but uh, there are developments around the country. Uh, many of these uh, uh, repair, repair and retrofit uh, methods and tools have been already implemented. This one is uh, one of the first, not one, it's the first the Greyfield or shopping center redevelopment in the country called Mashley Commons on Cape Cod. It was an old shopping center built in the 60s and uh, you know basically its life was over in the uh, mid 80s uh, and uh, it was uh, turned into a mixed use center uh, today it's a thriving uh, almost a town center of regional importance for the cape cod it is not uh, very large you can see that the scale of redevelopment is not overwhelming in our tour stories or three-story buildings offices uh, residential above retail the interesting thing is that uh, some of the buildings were preserved, some of the boxes, as you can see here, and some pedestrian uh, networks were punctured through the big boxes, so um, uh, there is more connectivity and more pedestrian, uh, more pedestrian, uh, a better pedestrian network. Um, there is an interesting um, phenomenon that there are national and uh, um, there is national and local tenant mix. Uh, uh, so it's not only the large uh, names, you know, the Pottery Barnes and the, the, the uh, Ann Taylors and all of those, but there are also smaller, uh, smaller uh, players, uh, live work units where people live and work in the same building, or um, uh, affordable incubator business space uh, or even housing. In again, in these so-called liner buildings, they are 22 feet uh, deep by 30. Uh, increments where small mom and pop shops are uh, uh, basically starting their businesses. They're very successful. When the businesses um, uh, get very successful, they can move to the larger spaces in the more urbanized uh, area. Uh, the next one is the mall. Um, it is it is probably the mall is the most uh, uh, the most promising contender for straw repair for very obvious reasons. The large uh, uh, ownership pattern, the large uh, site, usually you know between uh, uh, 40 and 80 acres, sometimes even larger, which is almost one uh, full neighborhood, up to 200 acres in some cases. A lot of non not developed land, a lot of uh, potential for future rebalancing. Uh, many of these places are already empty, uh, or in some cases. Uh, as for example, the Woodbury a Corporation a project, the University a Mall a retrofit. Even if the mall is doing fairly well, they are doing proactive thinking. They're doing a visionary redevelopment, so uh, the project will become a catalyst uh, for a much larger um, renaissance uh, of, uh, of the community. Um, in this particular case, this is a, a mall which is a typical. A t the typical example shown in the Spro Repair Manual, however, it's a real mall in uh, Gwinnett uh, County in uh, outside of Atlanta. But wherever I go and give these lectures, I find usually on Google very similar conditions. You can see a kind of the um, circular loop around uh, your South Town and Center Mall in Sandy, uh, Utah. So it's usually very, um, a very similar tools and very similar techniques can be used for redevelopment or repurposing of these malls. Um, and here I will show like three examples or three different uh, tactics. One is to retain the whole structure if, uh, if the mall is still uh, in good condition uh, and the retail can be uh, preserved or even if the mall it changes its function, it's a similar it is a similar redevelopment strategy. And of course, this is in place where there is growth of the population. This was the case in Gwinnett County, which is uh, booming in terms of um, uh, growth, economic and uh, uh, population-wise. Um, so it, it is basically, you have to go vertical with uh, the with parking in most cases where, in this particular case, there was um, 
public transportation coming uh, very close by. However, when you have, you, when you preserve the retail and when you add offices, residential, then the structured parking garages are in most cases inevitable, at least at this moment. Some of them can be designed in a way that they can be, uh, that they can be transformed later into different uses when many more people will be using uh, public uh, transportation. Here, the uh, loop around the, uh, the mall is used to introduce also a storm water management technique, a canal, which uh, faces a lot of the residential. It becomes not only an engineering facility, but also a uh, acidic amenity. This particular case is when the, uh, uh, most of the anchors are retained. Here you can see them with the green, uh, with the green roofs. And then there is a main street in between the main anchors, which are transformed into, some of them are transformed into different types of, of buildings with the courtyards. And then the rest are streets which lead to the main street uh, and are inhabited with um, different uh, uses. And then in the case when um, the, there is no growth in the population, then a smaller agricultural village can be accomplished um, uh, with uh, maybe only townhouses and houses without large, uh, uh, large garage structures and uh, in the place only a, a couple or actually all the, the anchors are still here but reconfigured with a large public space in the middle and uh, this happens to be the size of Piazza Campo de Sano, uh, um, Camp, uh, I'm forgetting, Piazza, <laughs> Piazza del Campo in Siena uh, which is uh, the size of the, uh, food uh, of the food court of this particular uh, mall in Gwinnett, uh, in Gwinnett County. Um, this is an interesting example when the mall uh, is entirely repurposed. Uh, it is uh, basically, it, w it was a mall which uh, was dead. This is in Rackspace uh, Windcrest and it was, uh, bought, it was actually bought by Rackspace, uh, their big uh, technological uh, company and they relocated there. Uh, and the interesting technique here is that you can make only a main street with a square at the front in the beginning and then build um, uh, subsequently uh, the urban fabric. You know, most of the surface parking was kept uh, in the back uh, and the main street is gradually uh, shaping up. You can see it here in uh, plan and uh, these are some of the uh, uh, interiors uh, uh, which are from mall uh, to uh, a fairly vibrant uh, co-working uh, space for the technical, for this uh, techno firm. Um, and now the mall retrofit in Utah, University Mall, uh, which is now called University Place. Uh, probably my presentation will be a little bit uh, behind because um, uh, things are happening very fast. Uh, in Orem, uh, we know that the project is under construction. And, uh, but I will show you some of the uh, original drawings which uh, we did uh, during our uh, charrette uh, in Orem a few years ago. And we're very happy to report that now the project is uh, under construction and I believe you will hear from uh, the Wood Woodbury uh, uh, Corporation representatives right after uh, this, uh, this um, uh, presentation here of the mall. And uh, this is, uh, these are basically and the sequence of drawings and plans which we do during charrette, during our charrette, we do actually many more, but uh, we had these uh, two as a kind of the main contenders. One with the square, which is remind us uh, more uh, about um, um, uh, the, the way Mormon planning uh, is done and the Savannah Square. And the other one, which actually was the final winner, to the uh, to the right uh, is uh, a more elongated square, but the main techniques here are keeping most of the mall uh, as it is, with certain uh, redevelopment inside, refurbishing, updating. Uh, some of the anchors uh, were uh, uh, incorporated different strategies, uh, but uh, it is adding to the north of the site, as you can see in both cases, a very strong public space. Uh, uh, adding a lot of residential, uh, office space, class A office space, all these different functions which will make uh, University Mall a university, a university place. It will make it uh, the real uh, anchor and the real catalyst of, uh, of Orem. 
Uh, we usually start uh, looking at urban spatial precedents, and these are the, as I mentioned, the Savannah uh, Square, the Jackson Square in New Orleans, you know, the uh, kind of the real square squares. Uh, and then going to other examples outside of the country to Piazza Navona. Um, and you can see here the wide variety of the new buildings. Uh, they're in darker color. Uh, they're, the, the interesting thing is that the Macy's, which is in the western edge, on the western end of the, um, of, uh, the western end of the mall, uh, initially we considered, or at least uh, with the first the plan which I showed, we considered that they will will be uh, is still interested in a kind of full uh, uh, um, visibility from uh, both state and university parkway. Uh, however, they told us that their destination that they don't need to, that they need to participate and be very integral to the whole community, and they are willing to have other development around them. So today, uh, there is an office being, building built being built on uh, University Parkway on the on the corner, and there will be more uh, such development uh, uh, which will be happening in the years uh, ahead. Um, this is just to show the different variety of buildings. You know, there will be grocery stores, there will be hotels, there will be expansion of the movie theater. It's just the full range of a really vibrant, uh, complete uh, community. One important tool is the regulating plan where the public spaces are delineated uh, with the darker line. Uh, within these lines, uh, the rest uh, can be left to local talent, to, uh, um, to, the, uh, to the preferences of the developer or the uh, local designers. But what is important is that the connectivities in the main public spaces are preserved. Diagrams showing the neighborhood structure. I, I, would, I, I talked about the pedestrian shed in the neighborhood um, community and the community size, and you can see the five-minute walk. It's a perfect, a perfect, uh, complete neighborhood uh, with the proposed transit routes, with a BRT on University Parkway, uh, with an internal uh, trolley system within the mall, uh, and some additional bus services uh, services along uh, University. Um, before and after figure ground, so these are always always effective drawings uh, for us to see the potential and the, uh, the potential of pro retrofit as a real estate generator. You can see uh, how a lacking of building footprints the drawing to the left is and how it begins to fill in with uh, real uses. Uh, the, uh, the only one remaining uh, is the Costco with a large parking lot. Uh, maybe a kind of depository real estate uh, for the future. And here, uh, the connectivity is much better in the second drawing. Uh, the streets which are just leading to the parking lots are now mostly connected. And then this is the Grand Plaza with uh, a kind of a section through the Grand Plaza in the drawing above in a view uh, towards uh, the Grand, uh, the Grand uh, Plaza from one of the streets uh, terminating on one of the office buildings. So some of these are these are the conceptual drawings from the charrette. Now uh, the drawings are almost uh, done. They're under, uh, you know, they're construction documents. And uh, I know that uh, a building, the office building of 100,000 square feet of uh, uh, class A office space is under construction, that uh, 470 units are under construction. Uh, the mall has been retrofitted uh, internally. Um, and now, uh, Mike, uh, is somebody going to talk about uh, about the project from Woodbury Corporation? Yes, we do. We do have um, we do have Lynn Woodbury and uh, and Kathy Olson here from uh, from the Woodbury Corporation. We just think it's really interesting to look at this, and it's 67 acres of asphalt parking. So we're changing that 67 acres into office buildings, uh, five office buildings, a hotel, um, 1,500 residential units, a big park. Um, so if you want to go down, so this is kind of what um, this is what the first uh, phase kind of will be. We still have a lot of parking in the front because the retailers demand it. We still have a lot of parking on the side because the Sports Authority demands it. Um, so we're filling in the areas to start with that um, that we the retailers are allowing us to fill in, and we're hoping that someday that they'll let us come in and fill in the rest of it once they see the benefit to everybody. So we've got this office building. Which is over there. 
This office building is under construction. Uh, so the steel is up to the third floor. These residential units all the way over on the right hand side, doing a very good job here, the cursor, um, are up to the uh, the residential, the building that you see that says residential over on the left side there, right side, is topped out now and we're putting drywall in. And the building that's kind of buried behind the photograph of the theater is up to the third floor. And then this summer we will also be building the, um, the what we're calling the connector road. I'm just going to point to these. I'm not doing all your There's a connector road that comes through here, partly into the gear, and then it stretches out on an angle. And the connector road comes down into there. And we're kind of, kind of told that that eventually is going to turn into like the downtown Main Street of Orm. Because Orm doesn't really have a downtown, it's a railroad town. And so everything is just all stretched out along C Street. And we want to turn this kind of into their downtown. So then, yeah, I just have, we just have some comparative shots from the same direction, looking at all the parking, looking at what we're planning to put there, looking at it from the other side. Um, so this ends up being this whole area in the year is basically an office campus. And some of the top buildings here, this is all retail, this is here with the visitors and restaurants. And the other thing is up here, and we also have some of the potential stuff that you around the um, swimming tunnel. So that's uh, drawing through the first apartment buildings that are currently under construction. And then this is the big park. So this is evolved a little bit from the Long Valley Park that we originally started to um, we turned it into a grand lawn so we can have we've got the stage, so we can have concerts, we've got a show down. Um, this area now is kind of evolved into uh, what we're calling the library. So it's outdoor seating where you can do ping pong tables or there will be a little library stand where you can scrapbook, um, you know, pink or uh, um, bocce ball or whatever you want to put on the lawn. There will be yeah, the pictures and this kind of stuff, stuff that's uh, kind of hang out in the park. And then we have a huge, um, oh, so we, have, um, we have a huge total display area that can be indoor outdoor. So this wall is um, three large, almost hanger doors. They're 16 by 16, so we can open up. The outdoor children's play area and the indoor children's play area and in the summer on nice weather it will be kind of seamless. And then on the uh, you know on bad days we'll close it down and continue out and put so we have a variety of different time structures and supplies and um continuing service time because that would be a really fun spot. I'm glad you had that that was really good. Yeah. Thank you the amount of parking that the area that was initially developed it was in the mid 60s and then at that point in time the parking was sold because we acquired at the by the main department stores it's six spaces six spaces per thousand uh, which uh, as we uh, embarked upon this redevelopment and in some respects almost been a blessing because it's important to take out large portions of existing parking well, uh, in order to be able to build uh, the new uh, office uh, structure directly in front of places. Uh, and uh, our, our initial housing development there on the road on the uh, north end is uh, actually four levels of housing on top of a podium in the parking. And uh, we're getting densities of about 80 units per acre. And uh, in doing that, uh, we own the land. Uh, you know, like Kathy said, we have the uh, first 130,000 square foot office building on the University Park building under construction. We have uh, 478 uh, of the housing units under construction. We're now embarking on the design of our second office building, which will be off of the park. It will be a, uh, a nine story, 200,000 square foot office building. We're in the middle of speaking on after that. Uh, we found that, uh, that many tenants are beginning to uh, the vision of being able to uh, 
locate their court or their office facilities in the middle of a development where there's an you know, open up in the 1500 uh, there's 700,000 square feet of office uh, that will probably end up employing uh, as many as 4,000 people, and this is all being built uh, uh, at 800,000 square foot uh, shopping mall. This property was uh, still, even though we had lost the, uh, a major acre, uh, it was still very well positioned in the market area to where, as we looked at the various strategies that Galena mentioned on the shopping malls, we concluded that the mall was still a great element. And a lot of, especially when you're getting into transit-oriented development and some of these uh, types of uh, trying to urbanize more uh, uh, suburban areas, one of the challenges often is uh, you can build some of the housing, uh, but having enough mass of people and network to be able to support substantial retail is often a real problem here. We started with the substantial retail and are able to uh, build around it, and ultimately there'll be uh, multiple parking decks here to uh, accommodate the plan. And, uh, uh, so it's, it's been a, uh, a very exciting and, and challenging project. Uh, uh, so we could do a whole webinar on some of the, some of the problems that we encountered in trying to uh, execute the plan, uh, including having to assemble uh, pieces of property that are not under under developers' control, uh, having five different lenders that uh, had to uh, uh, sign off on the plan, uh, having the major tenants and uh, their extensive uh, uh, easement agreements that were in place and having to renegotiate all of those and give them the vision of uh, uh, what this could really be. We were fortunate that Macy's uh, had discovered that when there is more office uh, activity around their store, that there's more residential people that are within walking distance of the store, that in projects where they have that situation, their sales actually are much higher. And uh, helping them to be able to see that vision and to have that that could happen in not just uh, a heavy dense urban area, but in a more uh, traditional suburban type of development uh, uh, was, uh, was, was a large challenge. But we involved them uh, from the very beginning of our, our uh, development process so that they were part of that planning process from the very first test that DPCs came in and uh, we conducted our, our design chat. So I think as, as you consider and look at some of these things, it's very important to, uh, uh, to engage the key players that uh, are the stakeholders in the property in the very beginning to help them to begin to see the vision of what uh, what is possible to be done. Uh, and one of the other things that we discovered that I think is awesome and gives me a lot of hope for being able to do this on a small scale, even though I can power centers and food centers. In the office building, the tenants still want their tax um, you know, at Christmas time, they need that tax deduction perfect. But if you put an office building in there, the office uses it from 9 to 5 which is not a big time for the retail users, and then it's empty on the weekends and evenings, which is some retailers really want. So you can put the parking down to like three for that one, and everybody shares parking, and you get a lot of stuff on um, um, large field parking. Yeah, the shared parking is, uh, is an essential exercise uh, to go through. 
which does allow the ability to the operation of the plan, as you were able to see. Um, I think another thing is that we were fortunate to have uh, uh, great support in the, from the city in, uh, in their efforts here, because, uh, uh, again, we could do a whole webinar on the process that we went through and really creating a, an entirely new zone for this uh, this area, which didn't exist in the city before, which would allow this kind of mixed use uh, integrated development uh, uh, that is, uh, again, to the many communities uh, their zoning ordinances just aren't structured to be able to allow some of these things to happen. And uh, so it was a, an educational effort uh, with, uh, with the community and the uh, municipal entities involved, and including, uh, including the transit authority. Uh, we got all of these people in from the very beginning of the, uh, of the process that uh, we can really help uh, stage for us uh, uh, so that they could begin to see creation. And so we began to feel like they actually had uh, uh, a stake in, uh, in making this happen also. Uh, it wasn't just a developer coming and throwing a time out to, uh, to the community and say, here's what we want to do. Uh, uh, it really started with, here's our problem. What do you think we ought to do? And then with the revision of uh, a good architects and funders like the EBC group, uh, uh, they were able to begin to introduce some of these concepts of uh, how uh, a traditional suburban uh, uh, community or development can become more open. The other project that we uh, uh, brought just uh, uh, is really the Shoehouse Center in, uh, in South Lake. The overall. Yeah, up higher. Up higher? Yeah. There you go, the Google Earth. So, uh, uh, probably most of you are familiar with the Sugar House area, uh, which is uh, an area of Salt Lake City that is currently undergoing a great evolution with the some of the vision of some of the, the city planners and, and other people involved there. Uh, we uh, own property in the Sugar House area. Uh, we uh, actually uh, entered into an agreement and partnership with the, uh, the owners of the Sugar House Center, which is you know, pretty much a conventional suburban type of uh, shopping center, strip shopping center on the edge of, uh, of the more uh, central condition of the core of the Sugar House area. Uh, the, uh, uh, the development is being done kind of in steps and phases. Uh, uh, our first step was actually to uh, uh, create the building and garden or community. The Westminster City Housing, which uh, in, in working that project out, we had to do property exchanges with uh, four different property owners, plus the city and the county to help uh, facilitate the connection of Sugar House Court under 13 feet uh, uh, in what's called the John Housing. Uh, 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 to connect uh, Sugar House Park now uh, with uh, the rest of the community uh, uh, being able to reach the barrier that uh, you know, the six-lane highway with uh, 40,000 cars a day on it. Uh, and so 
as good to do from a idolatry day, the one who is down on these luxury uh, armchair type days. Uh, and um, uh, that uh, next block, the piece of that will be developed. Uh, similarly, where we will have uh, our two levels of, of, of office and detail with, uh, uh, with housing units that talk of that. And uh, ultimately, we are going to be recreating a more of a traditional with a student pattern uh, in, uh, in previous shopping center uh, uh, with uh, developments, uh, multi-story developments uh, in each block of it. Uh, but uh, again, this is all part of the vision of what can be done to improve a development center of this sort is something that is uh, a lot more identified and enduring and which will have a life uh, that will uh, uh, not be just an empty set of seven hours with the residents that are living there, the, uh, the businesses that are located there, and uh, that of course the this is exciting. You guys are doing some very cutting edge stuff. This is this is exciting that uh, you're actually demonstrating what it is that that uh, Galena was was sharing with us in terms of straw repair. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for being willing to share with us. <laughs> Well, we have uh, we have hit our limit in terms of the time that we uh, we told you that we would we would keep you occupied. We we really really appreciate your participation and attendance uh, with our with our webinar series. Um, we look forward to uh, making an announcement um, in the in the coming weeks about our next one and. Uh, if, uh, if, if any of you have ideas in terms of topics that are of interest that you'd like to share with us, we would certainly be open to, to suggestions and then going after speakers that will, that will help in our, in our education process. Um, we, we're, we're, we're short on time, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, unfortunately cut the, the Q&A, but um, I'm certain that uh, if you have a particular sprawl repair question, um, I'm, I'm quite confident that if you were to email Galena directly, she'd be more than happy to, uh, uh, to share her thoughts with you in terms, in terms of a question that you may have. Um, Galena, 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 are you still with me? Yes, absolutely. Yes, and I will answer every question. Galena's email address is uh, Galena, G-A-L-I-N-A, -A, at dpz.com. Um, feel free to, uh, to, to also contact any of the CNU Utah board members if, if we can be of assistance with, with questions or, like I said, any ideas that you might have on topics that would be a benefit to uh, to prepare a webinar for. Again, thank you for your participation, and we look forward to uh, to hosting all of you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.